welcome to the podcast, Buffy and the Art of Story Season 4. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. Today we'll be talking about Season 4, Episode 8, Pangs, the only Thanksgiving episode in Buffy. I am Lisa M. Lilly, novelist and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. You can check out my supernatural thrillers and mysteries for free at Lisa Lilly, that's L-I-L-L-Y dot com slash free. As to Pangs, in particular, we'll talk about how the writers weave exposition in through conflict in such an amazing and seamless way, clever dialogue lines that link one scene to the next, whether or not the plot justifies Angel's presence in this episode, characterization that I didn't pick up the first many times I watched the episode and that makes this story works so much better for me now that I see it, and the interplay of tone and theme. There will be no spoilers except at the end to talk about foreshadowing, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Pangs aired the first time on November 23, 1999. It was written by Jane Espenson and directed by Michael Lang. We start with opening conflict. That is meant to draw the viewer into the story. Here, it doesn't relate directly to the episode plot, but definitely does does to the entire premise of the series. A college guy walks through a wooded area. He looks a little lost and nervous, especially when he hears something rustling in the bushes. He turns and Buffy's there. She says, looking for me? He looks puzzled until she punches him and he turns into a vampire. This is a nice callback to the opening conflict in the pilot episode where Darla, dressed as a schoolgirl, looked very nervous when a high school boy led her into the deserted high school and then she turned into a vampire and attacked him. This vampire calls Buffy Slayer, tells her why doesn't she go back to where she came from and says things were great before you came. They fight, Buffy stakes him and says, and they say one person can't make a difference. This is a good thumbnail of the show itself, and it touches on the theme of this episode in a subtle way, or at least one of the questions the episode raises, which is what is Buffy as one person to do about her country's history? The vampire is dusted, but Buffy pauses as if she heard something or sensed something. But as she looks one way or another, she sees nothing out of place and she walks off. At 1 minute 13 seconds in, the camera pans to Angel hidden in the foliage. And I wonder if that one person line was also a subtle reference to Angel being there, as in can he make a difference as one person here for Buffy, and in a larger sense, can he make a difference in Los Angeles, where he has gone to fight the good fight. This is one of the first examples where I saw much more going to the theme of the episode as I wrote out my outline for today than I had seen in any of my previous viewings, and it made Pangs much more interesting to me. Whether that was an intentional theme reference to Angel or not, it's a great hook to see him right before we cut to the credits. When we come back, our characters are at a construction site. There's a banner overhead. The dean of the university introduces a professor of the anthropology department. Xander's in the background wearing a construction hat. He's holding a shovel. He's with other construction guys. Buffy, Willow, and Anya are watching off to the side. The professor talks about the university outgrowing its cultural center and about the spacious new facility that they are doing the groundbreaking ceremony for today. 
Anya says to Willow and Buffy, have they ever seen anything so masculine? Buffy asks, does she mean the dean or his wife? But Willow points out that Anya means Xander in his jeans and his tank top, which does show his arms off really nicely. That's my comment, not Willow's. Anya finds what Xander is wearing so much sexier than the outfit from his last job, but Willow misses the free hot dogs on sticks. This is... A good example of what we'll see throughout the episode, humor and minor conflict coming out of a brief misunderstanding that conveys a ton of information. We know Xander has a new and better job, that he's had uh, several previous jobs, and we know specifically about one of them. And it lets us know that he and Anya are together, which is confirmed when Anya says, oh, I'm imagining having sex with him right now. The professor talks about the groundbreaking being so soon before Thanksgiving and how that's wonderful because it's all about the melting pot and says contributions from all these cultures making our culture stronger. Willow is frustrated. Thanksgiving's not about blending cultures, she says. It's about one culture wiping out the other. And then they make animated specials about the maze and the big belt buckles. And they don't show the next part, quote, where all the bison die and Squanto takes a musket ball to the stomach, end quote. Buffy says, okay, now for some of that, you were channeling your mother. Willow agrees that yes, for some of it. And that's why her mom doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving or Columbus Day because of the destruction of indigenous peoples. And Buffy says she never thought about it, and with her mom at Aunt Arlene's this year, she's not getting a Thanksgiving. Looking back on this episode two decades later, I still have trouble imagining that the anthropology professor at that time was saying what she did about the melting pot. I remember even as a grade school kid And I don't want to say what decade that was, but we talked about how the melting pot wasn't an accurate analogy. But as to Buffy saying she's not thinking about these issues, as best I remember these types of comments on Thanksgiving and Columbus Day, I don't remember hearing anything about that. Maybe because my world was too limited, but I think that is something that has changed and makes the show a bit dated. My sense is we're meant to see Willow's mother as extreme, and now I don't think that she would be seen that way. All of this, though, is here for a very practical reason for the story, which is to explain why Willow doesn't have somewhere to go for Thanksgiving and to allow Buffy to comment on that as well. And this also comes out through minor conflict. Joyce going away for Thanksgiving and leaving Buffy by herself never quite rang true for me. I get that they needed to get Joyce out of the way. It just doesn't feel right to me that Joyce just flies off and leaves Buffy alone when it's Buffy's first year away at college and she probably hasn't seen her very much and is missing her. I would have liked just a little more to to buy this. Maybe Arlene is moving out of the country in a month and this is Joyce's last chance to have a Thanksgiving dinner with her for a few years. And Buffy can't go because she's got to catch up on studying or there's some slaying reason. At 4 minutes 33 seconds in, the professor takes a shovel and digs the first dirt, which upsets Anya because Xander is supposed to dig and the professor is not rippling at all. Willow tells her it's just ceremonial, and at 4 minutes 43 seconds in, Xander starts digging. Anya tells them she's imagining having sex with him again, and Buffy comments, imaginary Xander is quite the machine. We're about 10% through the story, which is why I mentioned the timing twice in a row. Usually here we see something that sets our main plot rolling. I think of it as a story spark or inciting incident. Here, it could be either of those first shovels full of dirt, disturbing the buried mission below and setting off the main plot. 
But if those aren't what does it, definitely the ground collapsing at five minutes, nine seconds in and Xander falling through into an underground cavern definitely gets the story rolling. As we'll find out, this disturbs spirits there. Xander is just struck by all the dust. He yells up to his co-workers that he's okay, then looks around, sees a cross on the wall, and says, where am I okay? We cut to Angel doing what he does best and lurking. He's in the wooded area near Buffy's dorm, looking at her windows. We switch to Buffy, who's peering out her dorm room window, as Willow explains that Xander dropped into an old Sunnydale mission that everyone thought was lost. So while it is not a dialogue line connecting Angel to Buffy, there is that visual of the window and seeing it from both sides. One of many really nice scene transitions we have in this episode. Buffy isn't really listening to Willow and Willow asks if there's something outside. Buffy says no and apologizes. She asks how can you lose a mission, a hairbrush she can understand and adds, and by the way, I will get that back to you. But a mission? Willow tells her an earthquake in 1812 buried the mission. Everyone thought it was leveled and they built right over it, like the church that the master was buried in. A nice callback to season one. And Willow asks, doesn't it make you wonder what else is under our feet? And Buffy says, mostly she's found sewers full of demons. Willow shuts the door on the noises of other students who are excited about going home for Thanksgiving, and Buffy says, it's so not fair. I mean, they all get a family holiday just because they can go home to their families. Willow responds, mm, it's a turvy, topsy world. Buffy decides she'll do Thanksgiving. Willow scolds her. She thought Buffy agreed earlier that it's a sham. Thanksgiving is all about death. But Buffy says, it is a sham, but it's a sham with yams. It's a yam sham. Willow tells her she can't jokey rhyme her way out of this. But Buffy tells Willow it's like what Professor Walsh says about sense memory. Buffy smells a turkey and she's eight years old again with her mom and dad and everything's different now. Willow concedes that maybe there could be slight yams. This is both fun dialogue and encapsulates one of the themes here. What do you do about traditions that mean so much to you personally, separate from their origins, but that have very troubling origins? Buffy goes on that Giles probably has no plans, and Xander always tries to avoid his family gatherings. And she says, and look, pilgrims aside, isn't that the whole point of Thanksgiving? Everybody has a place to go. So this is our first very clear line that leads to the next scene because after Buffy says that, we cut to Spike. Sad music plays as he tramps through the woods, a dark wool blanket wrapped around him even though it's nighttime. We then cut to Riley, Forrest, and Graham dressed in camouflage, going through the woods looking for Hostel 17. Forrest grouses about getting a short Thanksgiving, but Riley says with the hostel on the loose, they're lucky to be going home at all. Forrest argues the hostel is neutered, can't hurt a single living thing, but Riley points out it's a threat because it knows about the initiative and says we do this the professor's way. And Forrest coughs, Mama's boy. Riley tells him with that cough, maybe he's sick. He shouldn't go home. Forrest assures him he's fine. And Riley, mostly joking around with all of this, says he just doesn't want anyone getting sick. This line leads to the visual of Xander. He is looking deathly ill and struggling to put socks on. Anya comes downstairs. She's upset. She went to the construction site to watch him digging, and he wasn't there. And she tells him, I inflicted a lot of putrefying diseases on men when I was an avenging demon. You look like you're getting all of them, which turns out to be mostly true. She helps him get undressed and into bed, and he tells her she's a strange girlfriend. Anya says, I'm a girlfriend? At 10 minutes 48 seconds in, there's eerie music and green fog or vapor rises from the underground area. 
we cut to the professor in the old cultural center. She's telling someone on the phone she can't wait to go down into that mission herself, but they need to find a new location now, and she hopes this doesn't cost the center another year. We are right around one quarter way through the episode. This is where I look for what I think of as the one quarter twist. It is the first major plot turn. It should come from outside the protagonist and spin the plot in a new direction and raise the stakes. Here it definitely comes from outside Buffy because that green vapor drifts into the center near a display case, forms a hand around a knife in the case, and at 11 minutes 27 seconds in, forms into an entire man who is, we'll find out, a member of the Shumash tribe. He cuts the professor's throat with the knife, and we cut to a commercial. When we return, there's police tape over the doorway. Buffy and Willow enter. Willow has a flashlight, and she's talking about what she heard on the news. The coroner's office reported the professor was missing an ear, and Willow speculates that maybe it was a witch because she says, there's some great spells that work better with an ear in the mix. Buffy responds, that's one fun little hobby you've got there, Will. Willow then guesses maybe there's an ear harvesting demon or maybe the professor did it herself. And Buffy says, so she brutally stabbed herself, dumped the body, then cut off her own ear? Willow starts to say, no, she brutally stabbed herself, then cut off the ear, then and concedes she's maybe off her game. Buffy discovers that an early 1800s Shumash ceremonial knife is missing from the case. So this entire scene is exposition that we need for the purpose of the plot of the episode. This actually mixes a number of ways to dole out that exposition while keeping the audience engaged. One, it's dark, it's a little eerie, so we have mood. We use some minor conflict between Buffy and Willow over the idea of a spell. And And humor in the dialogue, plus action as they move around the room, which keeps it more interesting. Buffy says the knife looks like it was pretty, and she says scary. But we cut to her in Giles' kitchen saying the word scary as she unloads groceries. She is talking about the store. It was more like a riot. She thought she would have to use slayer moves on a woman hoarding the pumpkin pie filling. They talk about the murder weapon. Giles tells her Shumash Indians were indigenous to the area. And Buffy responds, do you even own a turkey pan? He asks again why this dinner is at his place and not her home. Buffy claims it's because he's the patriarch. He needs to follow the American traditions. But Giles says, and this is in no way an elaborate scheme to stick me with the cleanup. To which Buffy responds, how about that ceremonial knife, huh? Buffy pauses mid-stride as she's passing him in the kitchen. But when he asks if she's all right, she says, yes and tells him she needs to pick up a few more things at the store and leaves. It's 14 minutes, 8 seconds in, an angel emerges from the back bedroom. He says Buffy sounds good, though kind of intense about Thanksgiving. Giles says perhaps Buffy's a bit lonely. But he meant the murder when he asked what Angel thought. Angel says it probably relates to the vision his friend had. So this tells us why Angel is here. I never before caught that line about Giles thinking that Buffy is a bit lonely. I like this because it helps explain why Buffy is so intense about Thanksgiving and cooking dinner and getting all the right foods which never quite worked for me before. In the beginning, it's fun, but it becomes more difficult for me to reconcile with Buffy as a character. This insight that perhaps it is because she is feeling so lonely. Her life is different. She doesn't see her mom very much. She doesn't see her friends as much. They don't all get together as a group the way they used to. And she doesn't see Giles as much either. Giles wants to tell Buffy Angel is there. Angel says no. If she knew, it might distract her. 
They agree there's a connection between the professor's death and the old mission, that something is angry about being disturbed or something was set free. Angel tells Giles Father Gabriel knows about the history of the mission, so Giles will try to contact the priest. He then returns to the personal issues and says, it's not fair. You know that's what she'd say. You can see her, but she can't see you. Angel responds, believe me, I'm not getting the good half of this deal. To be outside looking in at what I can't, you know, I'd forgotten how bad it feels. This line perfectly describes Spike, and we cut to the next scene where sad Spike, now with the blanket over his head, maybe for warmth, looks into a crypt from outside at a group of vampires eating a human. Today's episode of the podcast Buffy and the Art of Story is sponsored by my nonfiction book, Happiness, Anxiety, and Writing, Using Your Creativity to Live a Calmer, Happier Life. I wrote this book because I found for myself and many other creative people I knew that the same vivid imagination that helps us come up with compelling plot turns or character backstories or just tell great stories in whatever form we do can also lead to anxiety because most of storytelling comes down to asking what if and often coming up with the worst possible answer and in real life those kinds of questions can lead to spinning through endless negative outcomes and thinking about the worst thing that could happen and whether you'll be able to deal with it which for me usually happens when I wake up in the middle of the night. So happiness, anxiety, and writing shares ways to instead use imagination and writing skills to create more calm and happiness. From the book, you'll learn techniques to derail anxious, repetitive thoughts, ways to talk to yourself and other people, deliberately choosing your words to promote more calm rather than reinforcing your worries, specific targeted exercises to direct your creativity and imagination in positive ways, and how to rewrite the best parts of your life and relive them to feel overall happier and calmer. Happiness, anxiety, and writing will be free if you read on Kindle or in Kindle apps April 13, 2021 through April 15, 2021, but you can always get it in workbook form if you would like to write answers to questions or write out the exercises that are suggested, or you can buy it in ebook form right now only on Kindle, but after mid-May or so, it will probably Probably be available on other platforms as well. So that's happiness, anxiety, and writing using your creativity to live a calmer, happier life by L.M. Lilly. Link in the show notes, or you can go to writingasasecondcareer.com slash happiness. Backing up to the Angel Giles scene, the only part it contributes to the plot is Father Gabriel, but Giles so easily could have simply known about Father Gabriel or made a couple phone calls. After the spike scene, we switch to Buffy, who is telling Willow that whipped cream is only right if you whip it yourself. It's not good enough in a canister. Side note, either can work, but it is very different taste if you whip it yourself. Willow says, sure, and later they can churn their own butter and make sweaters out of sheep. Buffy promises this is the last thing. She has an appointment with that priest that Giles called about. I had forgotten how much I love the dialogue in this episode. Willow in particular has some wonderful lines, and I feel like you can always tell when it's Jane Espenson writing the dialogue because it is so very fun. Riley sees the two of them and calls out to Buffy. Willow very obviously leaves them alone saying, look, they're selling coffee in the coffee shop. Yum. She goes deeper into the interior of the indoor-outdoor coffee bar and bumps into Angel, who puts his hand over her mouth 
So she doesn't alert Buffy, and through his hand, she says something about whether he's evil again. He tells her he's not. He's there to help. He explains about his friend's vision, which is a little repetitive. We've just heard that at Giles' apartment. And he tells her something else he just told Giles, which is that it'll make things worse for Buffy if she knows he's there. Here, though, it segues into some nice character work because Willow says she doesn't get, quote, all this leaving for her own good garbage because that's what it is, unquote. And she goes on about how you can't give up just because there's obstacles. And Angel says, Willow. And Willow says, sorry, my stuff. Then he says she knows how he feels about Buffy, but things are different now. And Willow understands. He starts to say more, but Willow interrupts. Hey, is Cordelia really working for you? I mean, because that's got to be a special experience of all the people you could have hired. Angel rolls his eyes and says, Willow, I'm here to protect Buffy. I don't have a whole lot of time for personal stuff. She asks how she can help and we get a little more humor because Angel says, well, if you can just tell me, who's that guy? He's looking at Buffy, who is happily talking to Riley. I like the humor here, the Cordelia stuff, definitely a bit of a commercial for Angel the series, which makes sense because at the time, Buffy and Angel were airing back to back. So right after this Buffy episode, if you simply left your TV on, you would see the Angel episode where Buffy crosses over into Angel. We switch to Buffy's point of view She is telling Riley about Thanksgiving. It'll be just like when she was a kid, but without her building a fort out of her mashed potatoes. And if he doesn't already have plans, he should come. He thinks it sounds great, but he's leaving tonight for Iowa. And Buffy says, Iowa, it's one of the states in the middle, right? He talks about his parents. They live on a farm. And after dinner, they take a walk by the river with a dog. They talk a little about home and Riley says, what's the line? Home's the place that when you have to go there and Buffy finishes, they have to take you in. Another lead into Spike because we cut to Harmony telling Spike to get out. He tries to cajole her into forgiving him for running out on her last time. Harmony's having none of it. She says... I've been doing a lot of reading, and I'm in control of my power now, so we're through. Spike starts kissing her neck, says she doesn't mean it. She insists she means it a lot while they move over to the bed, and Harmony says, no, I'm powerful and I'm beautiful, and I don't need you to complete me. She pulls a stake out from under the mattress and finishes, and you're mean. Spike says, you had that in our bed? You know how dangerous that is? Harmony says, let's find out. Spike tells her you wouldn't do it, and she says you did it to me, remember? Spike says, all right, all right, I'll go, just... Harmony says, what? And he says, can I have someone to eat? I love this scene. There is great conflict. It throws in a little backstory, but it is completely justified. I believe that Harmony would say all these things. And we get character growth for Harmony, plus we see how very hungry Spike is. We're nearing the midpoint of the episode. In a well-structured, strong story, usually here we see the protagonist making a commitment to the quest, throwing caution to the wind, or suffering a major reversal, or both. So I think we do have this here, but I I didn't see it until I was typing out the outline for recording today. At 20 minutes, 16 seconds in, we cut to Buffy in a church calling for Father Gabriel. She goes out back into the church yard and sees the priest hanging in a noose, and then the Shumash warrior slits the priest's throat, which, my bad pen, seems like overkill, but we'll find out why later. So that could be a reversal for Buffy. The reason I didn't necessarily see it as a major reversal is we don't know how much Father Gabriel would tell her. We don't really know that there's a huge amount riding on this. Although, of course, for Buffy, it's always a reversal if she gets somewhere too late to save somebody. The warrior says, you can't stop me. And Buffy says, you're very wrong about that. And they fight. And he says, I am vengeance. I am my people's cry. 
And he continues that his people called for an avenging spirit, Hoos, to carve out justice. And Buffy says, they tell you to start an ear collection? They're fighting and Buffy's about to prevail. And Hoos says, you slaughtered my people. Now you killed their spirit. This is a great day for you. She shoves him away. He stands and faces her, brings his hands together, and turns into a bunch of blackbirds that fly away squawking, or maybe crows. So that was at 21 minutes, 34 seconds in, so almost exactly midway through. We cut to Giles and Buffy, and Giles says it's clear they're dealing with a spirit, and it's common for Indian spirits to change to animal form. And Buffy tells him it's not common for her to freeze. She says she was ready for the takedown and she froze. So I didn't quite get that from the fight scene. I had to go back and watch it and realize maybe she didn't shove him away. She froze and he got away or she shoved him away because she didn't know what to do. So that I see as the major reversal for Buffy in in a couple ways. The main one is the freeze. And that it seems to be because there's a moral ambiguity here. Usually she is pretty clear that she's fighting evil. Even with Angel, he had gotten his soul back, but she killed him because he was going to suck the world into hell. It was the only way to stop it. So I guess she's about fighting evil and protecting people. And so she was protecting people. When she was against Faith, that was a little more of a gray area because Faith was human. And Buffy wasn't directly protecting anyone in the way she usually is in terms of killing a vampire before it's right about to attack someone. But she probably saw it as protecting Angel. If she killed Faith, she could save Angel, whom Faith tried to kill. So it was a bit more clear here she's starting to question that and also we have an antagonist who is mystical can turn into a vapor though she hasn't seen that yet but can also turn into birds so how does Buffy fight that Buffy tells Giles they don't say Indian anymore it's Native American I did some research. I was curious whether that made this dated. And I looked on the FAQs on the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. And there was one about what is the correct terminology. Indian, American Indian, Native American, Native. According to that site, at least, all these terms are acceptable. But the consensus is that whenever possible, Native people prefer to be called by their specific tribal name. But the entry goes on to say that Native American has been widely used, is falling out of favor with some groups, and the terms American Indian or Indigenous American are preferred by many Native people. So perhaps that makes this a bit dated. Giles says, oh, right, right, yes, always behind on the terms. I'm still trying not to refer to you lot as bloody colonials. And now Buffy states the moral ambiguity issue. She says, and the thing is, I like my evil like I like my men. Evil, you know, straight up, black hat, tie you to the train track. Soon my electro ray will destroy Metropolis. Bad. Not all mixed up with guilt and the destruction of an indigenous people. Giles points out that who's killed innocent people, but Buffy's distracted by the next step in the recipe, which calls for putting potatoes through a ricer. She's upset that Giles doesn't have one, but then has to admit that she doesn't know what a ricer is. Giles says, we'll mash them with forks, much like the pilgrims must have done. Did you catch the part where Hoos killed innocent people? Buffy says she did, and she'll stop him. She'd just like to find a non slay way to do it. There's a knock on the door. It's Willow with peas. Buffy's upset that they're frozen. This was the first time that I thought that perhaps Buffy is focusing on the recipe now and the cooking from this point forward because she can control the food and the meal. So that's what she keeps going back to rather than more directly dealing with this foe who is not unambiguously evil. That too made the episode work a bit better for me. And in fact, it works better for me than solely the loneliness idea because otherwise it feels so off to me that Buffy seems to not be taking these issues seriously or not be willing to deal with them. 
Willow also has a stack of books about the Shumash and the Buried Mission and all the atrocities that were done to them, which she explains when Giles says the Shumash were peaceful. Willow says they were until we came along. In between talking about the atrocities visited on the Shumash, throughout this conversation, there's some discussion of the peas. Willow tells them the Shumash were imprisoned. There was forced labor. They were hurled into a mission full of European diseases. And the few who tried to rebel were hanged. And for proof, the people who hung them brought back the Shumash ears to the accusers. So that's why the priest was hung and the professor's ear cut off. Buffy says, boy, the Cultural Partnership Center really didn't stress all that stuff. When Buffy asks about anything stopping the spirit, Willow queries whether they should be helping him. Giles says, no, I think we won't help the angry spirit with his rape and pillage and murder. A wolf watches through the window from outside as they talk. Willow agrees, no, they won't help do those things, but they could help redress the wrongs, bring the atrocities to light. Giles argues that if the history books are full of them, then they have been brought to light. They then argue about giving the land back to the Shumash, and Giles says it isn't their land, his and Willow's, to give. Buffy looks more and more upset, trying to jump in and calm things down. Giles tells Willow her concerns are blinding her to certain urgent facts. Willow calls him an unfeeling guy, and Buffy says, I have to baste. She goes into the kitchen, clearly upset. Giles' tone shifts, and he tells Willow in a whisper that he believes there's particular danger to Buffy. Willow reveals that she saw Angel too, and Giles comments, that's not terribly stealthy of him. And Willow says, I think he's lost his edge. This is a nice way to deal with moments in the plot that you need for the story, but that don't quite fit. Have your characters call it out and comment on it and give a potential explanation or at least a humorous take on it. Giles tells Willow that's why he thinks it's important to keep a level head, and we have a wonderful Willow line. She says, and I happen to think mine's the level head and yours is the one things would roll off of. There is another knock at the door. So this is our second and it's Anya supporting Xander. Giles says, you look like death. Willow says, are you okay? And Buffy says, you didn't bring rolls? At 25 minutes, 45 seconds in, Hoos is in the cultural center. He takes a bunch of weapons from a glass case after breaking more glass. And then we cut to Xander. So this scene is one that also feels unnecessary to me. I think we just wanted to break up that previous scene. But why wouldn't Hoos have just taken all the weapons the first time he was in the cultural center? Unless the idea is that he heard Buffy and Giles talking and recognizes that he will need more weapons or after fighting Buffy, he needs more weapons. Xander's lying on Giles' couch. He says the doctor told him he has lots of symptoms that don't really connect. Buffy thinks they do. She and Willow tell him about the Shumash getting various European diseases, malaria, smallpox, syphilis. Xander panics at the word various. Willow tries to reassure him that it's mystical and will probably go away as soon as, and Buffy cuts her off. As soon as what? We still don't know what we're going to do. Giles suggests giving Hoos some land. That should help. Buffy tells him sarcasm accomplishes nothing. Giles says it was sort of an end in itself. Anya tells Xander syphilis will make him blind or insane, but it won't kill him. But the smallpox will. Willow thinks there might be a spell, but realizes she's reading a stuffing recipe. Xander says he hates Hoos. Willow points out Hoos is just doing what was done to him. And Xander says, I didn't give him syphilis. I admire how much there is in this dialogue and the dialogue throughout the episode that is specific to the situation, but goes to the complexities of this issue of historical wrongs. The episode, though, I 
don't think reaches any conclusion other than perhaps saying some things about vengeance. Giles explains that because Xander freed Hoos's spirit after centuries of unrest, Hoos saw Xander as one of his oppressors, but he's not sure why Hoos went after the others, the professor and the priest. Xander is upset that there's a question of whether to slay Hoos, and Buffy stirs the mashed potatoes harder as Willow and Xander argue. Xander says he's a vengeance demon. You don't talk to vengeance demons. You kill them. Which doesn't make Anya happy. She's been stroking his forehead and she stops and says, I didn't know you felt that way. Willow argues it's a spirit, not a demon. Anya and Xander argue. He's saying she's an ex-vengeance demon and that's different. Which also raises that thematic question of how do you address past wrongs? Buffy stands. She says, this is no good. Everyone falls silent. They all look at her and she finishes, it needs more condensed milk and goes to the kitchen. Giles follows her and says Xander's in real danger. Is she sure the solution is pie? But Buffy will take pie over bickering and confusion any time and says, I'm going to have a Thanksgiving and it is going to be perfect. Giles tells her Hoos won't stop. Vengeance is never sated. It's a cycle, and all he will do is kill. This is probably as close as we get to an answer to one of the thematic questions whether taking vengeance is appropriate. And the show seems to be saying that it is not, or at least that it doesn't solve anything. It just creates more violence. There is a third knock on the door. So as with many three beats, this third one will turn the idea on its head. The first two were friends and this one is Spike. He is covered in that blanket now. So uh, it's daytime. So it's covering most of his skin. Buffy throws Spike into the sun, even though he said, help me. And he says, what part of help me do you not understand? And Buffy says, the part where I help you. Spike tells her he can't bite anyone and says to Willow, tell them what he did. And Willow says, you, you said you were going to kill me and then Buffy. Spike says, yes, bad, but let's skip that part and get to the part where I couldn't bite you. If you are enjoying the show and would like to help see it continue, you can become a patron. You'll get access to bonus content for as little as a dollar a month. Those bonus episodes include questions and answers and breakdowns of other shows, including the pilot episode of Jessica Jones. And I am recording right after this a breakdown of Angel Season 1, Episode 1. So it is just like what I do here on Buffy and the Art of Story. And it includes some comments on the tone shift from Buffy to Angel, what is carried over from one show to the other, and what is not. At the $5 a week level, you will also get the ebook edition of Super Simple Story Structure, a quick guide to planning and writing your novel. And if you would like to support the show, but not in a monetary way, you can also post a review on Apple Podcasts or tell a friend about the show or share it on social media. I would really appreciate that and it will help more people find the podcast. Spike says, Spike had a little trip to the vet and now he doesn't chase the other puppies anymore. He can't bite. He can't even hit anyone. And Buffy says, so you haven't murdered anyone lately? Let's be best pals. This is also a comment on how to deal with past atrocities. Does it matter if you haven't done anything bad lately? Or in the bigger picture, does it matter if your ancestors did something terrible? At 30 minutes, 28 seconds in, Spike says he can give them information. He has the inside scoop on the soldier boys they're hunting for. And he says, come on, what have you got to be afraid of? 
This is a nice lead in to what they have to be afraid of because we cut to Hoos. He does a spell calling for additional warriors to take human form, join the battle, and bring revenge. And we cut to a commercial. We return to Buffy tying Spike to a chair. At 31 minutes 51 seconds in, it hits Giles that the other victims are all authority figures. And they talk about who else fits the pattern, and Buffy says the dean. He was at the ceremony, and he runs the university. She asks Willow if she's found anything in the books about a nice, non-judgmental way to, you know, kill Hoos. Willow's not on board. This isn't a Western. They're not at Fort Giles. It's one oppressed guy. So we have an echo of that question in the beginning or that statement. They say one person can't make a difference. Buffy says, Will, you know how I feel about this. It's eating me up. And then she says to Anya, a quarter cup of brandy and let it simmer. Then returns to talking to Willow, but even though it's hard, we have to end this. Yes, he's been wronged. And I personally would be ready to apologize, but I... And Spike says, oh, someone put a stake in me. Xander comments, you got a lot of volunteers in here. There's a little more back and forth, and Spike says, you won, all right? You came in and you killed them. You took their land. That's what conquering nations do. It's what Caesar did. And he's not going around saying, I came, I conquered, and I felt really bad about it. The history of the world isn't people making friends. You had better weapons and you massacred them. End of story. And Buffy says, well, I think the Spaniards actually did a lot of, not that I don't like the Spaniards. Spike says, listen to you. How are you going to fight anyone with that attitude? Willow says she doesn't want to fight anyone if they could just talk to Hoos. And Spike says, you exterminated his race. What could you possibly say that would make him feel better? It's kill or be killed here. Take your bloody pick. And Xander says, maybe it's the syphilis, but some of these points make sense. And Giles says, I made a lot of these points earlier, but fine. Buffy tells them whatever they decide, someone has to warn the dean. Willow says she'll go. Xander wants to as well, but Buffy asks if he's sure he's up to it. And we get a very fun spike line. He says, oh, leave that one. He looks like he's ready to drop any minute. And I think I can eat someone who's already dead. And Xander says, I'm up to it. Buffy tells him to hurry. Dinner's in an hour. And this is where it really feels off to me that Buffy says that. In the previous instances, it did feel like a coping mechanism. For me, this goes just a little too far. Speaking of a little too far. We are a little beyond the three-quarter point of the episode where I look for the last major plot turn. It usually grows right out of that midpoint reversal or commitment, but takes the plot in another new direction. And we will see one here, a clear one that comes a little late, but probably that three-quarter turn already happened just very quietly. Spike is complaining he wants to get fed. Buffy threatens to gag him and says she's going to have a nice, quiet, civilized... And at 34 minutes, 54 seconds in, an arrow flies in through the window and hits her centerpiece. So that line leads to that action, the arrow, which changes everything. So now the story spins and becomes about fighting the warriors. So the thing I think that really was the turn happened earlier when Hoos called upon those additional warriors to take human form and help him fight. Buffy sees Hoos at the window. She tries to tell Tell him how sorry they are. He keeps shooting arrows. A window breaks behind them. They realize there are more fighters out there. We cut to Willow, Xander, and Anya exiting a university building. It's night. The dean thought they were crazy. Xander says maybe if Anya hadn't to open with everybody got both ears. Angel approaches. Xander looks nervous and says he's evil again. Angel says, I'm not evil. Why does everyone think that? Willow tells him Angel's there to protect Buffy and Angel says, you know, I haven't been evil for a long time. They explain why they were checking on the Dean, that Hoos was after a leader, but Angel says to a warrior, that means the strongest fighter. Hoos will go after Buffy. So Angel says he'll call Buffy and he breaks the locks on some bicycles so the others can ride back to Giles' apartment. This is another example of how Angel is unnecessary here, which we'll highlight in a moment in a in a funny way. Him figuring this out doesn't do anything because Giles already got that. 
So in the next scene, Giles answers the phone. Arrows are flying everywhere. And Giles says, yes, um, yes, yes. We're well aware of that. We're under siege now. Thank you. Hangs up. Buffy crawls across the floor towards Giles' weapons chest, but gets shot in the hand. Spike is desperate and tries yelling an apology. Giles says, we need help, after Buffy says, there are too many warriors out there. It's 37 minutes, 13 seconds in. We cut to triumphant music and Willow, Xander, and Anya ride bicycles across a lawn. This is a nice homage to E.T., the bicycle scene. There is a link in the show notes to a clip of it. Inside the apartment, Giles and Buffy coordinate shooting with crossbows, but they miss. Outside, our friends arrive. Using a planter and shovels, they fight a couple of Hoose's men. Now we are at the climax, where the opposing forces have their final clash. At 38 minutes in, Hoose breaks into the apartment and confronts Buffy directly. They fight hand-to-hand. Two more fighters break in, and Giles fights them. Spike has several arrows through him. Buffy stabs Hoose through the heart, but it doesn't even hurt him. And she says, Giles, these guys, they don't die. A warrior throws Xander inside the apartment. Angel reaches the courtyard and snaps the neck of the warrior Willow and Anya are beating with a shovel as Willow is saying, why won't you die? Anya looks turned on after Angel kills the guy and she says, what's he like when he is evil? Angel throws, uh, I want to say a spear, but I think it's it's probably some sort of uh, garden implement in from outside and kills one of the warriors. Buffy doesn't notice there's so much going on. She slashes Hoos with the ceremonial knife. He turns into a giant brown bear. And Spike says, a bear, you made a bear. Buffy says, I didn't mean to. Spike says, undo it, undo it. But the bear, much larger than Buffy, grabs her. She fights, gets away. Outside, Angel continues fighting. He has done a couple things here, but it is still hard to see why this evil was supposed to be so great that he needed to come back to Sunnydale. We could lift Angel out. And it wouldn't change this episode hardly at all. I think it would improve the episode because we would skip all the repetition where Angel explains why he's there and that he's not evil. Buffy stabs the bear with the ceremonial knife. It briefly morphs into Hoos and then into the green vapor. Outside, the warriors, our friends, including Angel, are fighting, also turn to vapor and disappear. So this resolves our main plot conflict, but not the thematic question, at least not the larger one. As Spike said, it was kill or be killed, but that sidesteps the larger question about dealing with historical wrongs when there is not an imminent threat. Now we move to the falling action. That's where we tie up loose ends and resolve any subplots. At 40 minutes, 25 seconds in, everyone drifts inside toward the table other than Angel, who's still outside. Angel is watching. He sees Buffy reflected in a mirror. He takes a last look and walks off. Buffy looks at the mirror herself right after that and looks puzzled. Spike is still on the floor and says, what happened? Did we win? We cut to dinner. They're almost finished. Willow feels lousy, but Giles says the turkey came out splendid. Willow clarifies, saying two seconds with an indigenous person, and she turned into General Custer. And Giles says violence does that instinct takes over. And Spike comments, yeah, that's the fun. Giles tells Buffy good work on both counts, dinner and fighting. She says it wasn't quite the perfect Thanksgiving, but it seemed right to Sander. A bunch of anticipation, a big fight, and now they're all sleepy. And Giles points out they all survived. Buffy agrees, the first Thanksgiving on her own, and they all got through it. And Willow comments, and they all worked together. It was just like old times. Xander has been eating steadily here, and without looking up, he says, yeah, especially with Angel being here and everything. Buffy looks shocked. They all look down the table at her. We cut to the credit screen and hear Xander say, oops. I see Angel's role in this episode as doing three things. One, it's fan service. The fans of Buffy wanted to see Angel 
Two, it gives Buffy a reason to go to Los Angeles and sets up the Angel episode that aired right after this. So we get Buffy's loneliness before she goes to L.A. We hear why Angel thinks it's better to keep his presence secret. We emphasize his feelings for her, that he still loves her so much, but they can't be together. And third, this is a commercial for Angel, the series, which is, I am sure, why we get Willow asking about Cordelia, though I believe that Willow would ask that and would say those things. We also don't want Angel to come in and save the day because it's Buffy's show and because her not knowing he's there and only finding out after he's gone is key to why she crosses over onto Angel and goes to LA. She's mad at him. That made it, I'm sure, a real challenge to give Angel a role here when essentially he couldn't do anything that significantly affected the plot or that Buffy would notice. Other than foreshadowing, and I do have some things there, that is it for this podcast episode. Thank you so much for listening and a special thank you to patrons who support the show. I hope you will both stick around for foreshadowing and come back next Monday when I am doing something completely different. Rather than the next Buffy episode, Something Blue, I am going to break down season one, episode eight of Angel. I will remember you where Buffy crosses over into Angel. And we are back for spoilers and foreshadowing. The most obvious foreshadowing here is Angel's presence, but also him saying how much he still loves Buffy and how hard it is to be on the outside looking in because it will make it that much more devastating when he and Buffy have these moments together and then he needs to let go of her once again also devastating for Buffy, and we set that up a bit by how affected she is simply by Angel being around. And maybe, this just occurred to me, maybe that also explains some of Buffy's odd behavior in this episode. Buffy referred to Professor Walsh in conversation with Willow about sense memory, and then Riley and Forrest talk about doing things the professor's way, and Forrest says, Mama's boy. Maybe a tiny bit of foreshadowing that this will be an issue with Buffy and Riley. Little foreshadowing maybe, too, of the rivalry that Giles will feel for Professor Walsh that will come through in A New Man when Giles is turned into a demon and uh, takes a few moments to threaten Professor Walsh just for the fun of it. Xander's comment, you don't talk to vengeance demons, you kill them. And he tries to make this distinction, well, you're an ex-vengeance demon, which I think is a, a good distinction to make, but it casts this shadow. What happens when Anya becomes a vengeance demon again? How similar is Anya to whose? She is or sees herself as redressing wrongs but causes terrible harm while doing it in season seven Buffy will have to grapple with does she kill Anya and Xander will argue vigorously against it unlike his arguments here so that raises some interesting theme questions as well because in this episode we had Xander who's the one with syphilis pretty close to death's door saying hey yeah kill this spirit and Willow who is relatively safe in the moment they first had the conversation arguing against that and then fast forward to season seven Xander is saying there must be another way than for Buffy to kill Anya and he is not personally in danger at that moment Anya's comment I'm a girlfriend and she's so pleased does so much to foreshadow Anya's identity issues in Selfless in season seven, the one where Anya slaughters the fraternity guys, she is struggling with who is she? She was a vengeance demon for all this time. 
then she was Xander's girlfriend, wanted to be Xander's wife. Who is she? And she realizes she has not really figured that out. I would have so loved to see more exploration of Anya's character. Most of the time she is there as comic relief and she is great, but I like Anya best when she has more layers. The comment about uh, spells needing ears and Buffy saying that's a fun little hobby you've got foreshadows the next Buffy episode, Something Blue, where Willow unknowingly casts a spell that causes real danger to her friends. And finally, Buffy says, I like my evil like I like my men. Evil. And I think what Buffy means is clear, like clearly one way or the other, but she says evil. And that is so interesting because obviously it speaks to the past with Angel, the fact that there was always this danger lurking there. But it definitely foreshadows, one, that she and Spike will fall in love due to Willow's spell, but also many of the issues with Riley where Riley feels jealous of and threatened by Spike, and where Spike plays on that by saying to Riley, the girl likes a bit of monster in her man. So that is it for the spoilers and foreshadowing and for this podcast episode. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you will come back next time for I Will Remember You, Angel Season 1, Episode 8, where Buffy goes to visit Angel in Los Angeles, and they are attacked by a demon that alters their lives. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC, copyright 2021. All rights reserved.